my name is Kondu Buhle Dube, and welcome to this week's uh, installment of the Cyber School lesson entitled Mission to the Powerful. I am joined by my friend. Sia Bangalupat, but people just call me Sia. Yes, so thank you, Sia. And I'll be having a panel discussion with him today to discuss the lesson. Mm -hmm. um, the memory text for this week comes from Matthew 16, verse, 20, uh, verse 26. Yeah. I'll ask uh, Brother Sia to read it okay. for us. Okay, Matthew 16, verse? Verse 26. Verse 26. It's, for what is a man profited if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in, in exchange for his soul? Thank you so much. So before we continue and delve into the lesson, um, I will ask Brother Sia to open for us in a word of prayer. Okay, <coughs> let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for continuing to love us. Be with us as we go through the lesson. And help us understand, and anyone who watches this, let them understand as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. So, Brother Sia, this is a very interesting lesson which we're touching on. Mm -hmm. um, last week's lesson was uh, speaking about mission to the needy. Yes. And then this week we're having quite a contrast. Now we're <laughs> ministering to... Uh, the, the powerful, the rich and yeah. the powerful, right? So, um, Sabbath afternoon gives a very interesting introduction. Mm -hmm. um, it's showing us that wealth and power have not really changed much over the last several millennia and how people of old who are wealthy and powerful are quite similar, uh, quite similar to uh, mm -hmm. people who are wealthy and powerful in this day and age. Yeah. So uh, the Sabbath school lesson here on, on Sabbath afternoon is saying whether they lived in ancient Judea or live in modern day Brazil, wherever in the world mm -hmm. they live, not much has changed. So then it ties back to the verse in, uh, I believe in Ecclesiastes, which says um, there's nothing new under the sun. Ah, yes. Yes. So, so um, we see that not much has changed. So the needs of the wealthy, just like the needs of the poor, have not changed. Mm -hmm. They're still the same. So in this week's lesson, we will delve into uh, individual characters um, and people in the Bible who were powerful and who needed ministering in their own individual way. Mm -hmm. So now let us just go to Sunday, and it's a very interesting person, Nebuchadnezzar, yes. right? Nebuchadnezzar, a, a monarch of ancient Babylon. So yeah, just in your own words, I just want to understand um, how you believe uh, he had a need to be ministered to in his context in the, at that time. Yes. You know, when we think about it, okay, so I'm not rich. Yeah. <laughs> I know it might not be obvious now, but mm -hmm. I'm not. And when you think about rich people, they don't seem approachable in a way. I think we see them, they're powerful, they're up there. They need for nothing, they want for nothing, and that's what they have everything that they need. But in truth, in God's eyes, the things of this world don't matter in the end, right? So what matters is salvation, the spiritual growth, the spiritual health. And we see in Nebuchadnezzar, he was a powerful king, yes. Mm. And I believe the Sunday is focused on what happened after the whole statue incident, right? So he has this dream about a large tree, beautiful, birds are nesting, it's huge and it's beautiful, and then a heavenly messenger is sent to cut it down and what, was it chain the stump? Mm -hmm. Yes, so Daniel interprets the dream as a sequence of events that will happen to Nebuchadnezzar himself. Nebuchadnezzar, I think he was a proud king, I believe. He was, he believed in his own opulence. He had everything, like he was a king of the most powerful nation like in history. So for God to reach out to him, because even if in his richness and his wealth there, he still needed to be reached out to. God had to humble him. So in cutting down the tree, which the tree represented Nebuchadnezzar, he had to spend time out of his mind, basically. So he had to leave out his life in the wilderness. And in that experience, he was humbled and he changed. There is a verse, what was it? Daniel, was it four away? Even mm. after his ordeal, they're living in the wilderness. Yes. He exalts God in a way. So. Yeah, when I read this chapter, the thing that came to mind was tough love. Mm -hmm. So I know we don't like it. Like when we were younger, when parents would scold us or punish us, we never liked it. But 
in a way, it was them preparing us for the world, right? Mm -hmm. It was their way of showing that they loved us. So in, in a similar fashion, God had to take a tough love route to change Nebuchadnezzar and to bring him back to him. Yeah. So Nebuchadnezzar, in witnessing to the powerful, God literally intervened in that case. Mm -hmm. But in the lesson, it's supposed to affect us as well, right? So I think in a way we should realize that wealthy people, just because they have all the wealth in the world, doesn't make them a lost cause for mission or people we should avoid. Because you know that God still wants to use them. There are many powerful people in the Bible that God used. In the introduction, I saw there was Solomon. Like, he was one of the most powerful, richest people ever, and God used that man as well. Many kings in the Bible that God has used to further his work. And yeah, I think for Nebuchadnezzar, it's just a way of showing us that God can intervene, right? But even us, we shouldn't look at the wealthy as lost causes, I believe. Okay. Mm. And as you were speaking um, about Nebuchadnezzar and his arrogance, you know, mm. and his wealth and power and grandeur, I was thinking to myself that, you know, wealth can also be relative, you know? And it, it, for me, the lesson um, yes. towards the end here is, is speaking of mm -hmm. um, how we as people of the modern day and age may not be as wealthy mm -hmm. and as powerful as Nebuchadnezzar, True. but... Uh, we may actually have this characteristic of arrogance just like mm. he did. So how's, how important do you think it is for us to be wary of the type of uh, arrogance and pride that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had? Yes, you know, arrogance does not come from being wealthy or powerful. Mm. It comes from believing you are better than other people. Mm. And I, th I think sometimes it just happens without realization you find yourself speaking out about things because you think you know better than everyone else mm -hmm. and you don't want to listen, you're stubborn. And I think we should be wary of that. And then it is quite off-putting to talk to someone who is very convinced of their superiority about other, about like they are everything in this mm -hmm. world. And even as it is off-putting to us, it, it can hinder you from salvation. I think Nebuchadnezzar was arrogant. He had to be humbled to understand that who he was was because of God. And our arrogance can make us feel like we have the power when in fact we are only living because, well, by the grace of God, he loves us, right? Mm -hmm. He's the only reason we are surviving in this world as we are. So yes. arrogance just pulls us away from God in a way. Yeah, and I think it's, it's important that we, we be wary about this arrogance and not just uh, to avoid eating grass and living in the wilderness <laughs> like a madman, yes, but, uh, you know, um, its consequences are, are far mm. more wide-reaching uh, yes. than, than the humbling experience that he had. At least he went through it, this mm. experience to bring him closer to yes, God. Yes, he was changed. He was a changed yes. man. So now, moving on to uh, Monday, we have another powerful Cut. man. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, this is Naman. Mm -hmm. So uh, Naman was very interesting in that um, he's coming from a very pagan yes. society, yes. a Syrian society which had not known of God. And the mm. lesson speaks of a certain god which they worshipped at the time called Rimon. Rimon, yes. So this god Rimon was worshipped uh, by the Syrian people, and we know that uh, Naaman was a very high-ranking official. Yes. Um, so very like high. Captain, commander, or something. Yes, commander of the Syrian mm. armies. So that is a very <coughs> prestigious, very high-ranking yeah. uh, type of individual. And of course, you know, as as commander of the army, mm. you are to defend. Um, represent and to uphold the values of your of yes. your nation, of your country, king. of your king. Yes. So now Naaman is coming from this environment where he's worshipping uh, this God mm -hmm. um, and now has this encounter with Christ, you know. So he, he has a, an encounter with the prophet Elijah. Mm. Oh, uh, sure. Right? Isn't Elijah? Eli um, is it Elijah? <laughs> it is uh, Elijah. So uh, he has this uh, encounter with him, mm -hmm. um, therefore having an encounter with God. Yes. So having an encounter with God now sort of um, brings this challenge of, okay, I am now introduced to God, mm -hmm. um, but I still have this old life that I was living, yes. you know. Mm -hmm. So I think, like as we had tied to back earlier, that you know, life now as we, as we experience it is not much different to how life was mm, back then. New, right? Exactly. So um, there are some monarchs 
um, you know, without going into too much detail, mm -hmm. uh, who have been introduced to God, but um, there comes a challenge of mixing mm -hmm. or trying to reconcile their um, uh, traditional you know. African beliefs if, yeah. um, with, um, Christianity with Christianity well, yeah. and their newfound experience with God. So I just want to understand your thoughts on uh, this challenge and how um, Naaman had overcome this type of challenge. Uh, so in Naaman, it's the story, it's set after he was healed from his leprosy, right? Yes. So he wants to, was it? to thank God in a way, mm. basically for the experience that mm. he had. Mm. So he felt that he needed to leave his home to go to Israel mm. to do this, to thank him. Because even in his knowledge that there is only one living God, he still believed that that God was tied to the land of Israel. So even his beliefs that the God is tied to the land, that those pagan beliefs were still there in him. And I see that in that the lesson also, it goes to teach us that, oh, right, he, exper he tells this to Elisha, right, that he wants to go to Israel and, well, burnt offering, was it? I don't think it was burnt offerings, but he had to go thank God somehow. Mm -hmm. And in that going there, Elisha says, go in peace. And the lesson says that we shouldn't look at this as some as Elisha giving approval or disapproval. It's just literally go in peace. Whatever mm. gives your heart peace. Mm. So in a way, this teaches us that when we bring people like to the church, in a way, when we mission to them, we shouldn't be too forceful, too quick to push them to the deep end, to try to get them to, to push them too hard to change their lives instantly. We should just let things be... Because God is leading the way. They're learning. And you can't expect people to know everything about Christianity just from that one experience of coming to church and learning a few things. It takes time. It's a gradual process. And we should be patient with them, teach where we can, but mostly kind. I think there is that quote that says, uh, given the choice between being right and being kind, choose kind. So I think that applies here in that we shouldn't be too forceful, quick to push people to do certain things just because they are Christians now. They should act a certain way. We should teach them kindly and hope and pray because God is with them. We have to trust that God has power for these people. Because he changed us as well, right? That's the reason we're in church. We have learned something. Mm -hmm. So God is with them as well. And things will work out Indeed. even if we're not too forceful. God mm -hmm. has his own ways. He mm -hmm. knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I agree with, with Brother Sia. And before I continue, point of correction on my end. I think I said Elijah earlier <laughs> on. Yes, no, it, it is it is Elisha. So mm. um, uh, I think just to draw back to the lesson, there's something interesting which was said about Elisha and Naaman. And now when Naaman had gone back to his own land, his native land of Syria, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it was a challenge for him as uh, someone who's had an encounter with Christ to now yes. go back to a nation where... Um, they did mm -hmm. not know Christ, had not had that encounter with him just as he had had. Yes. And now it becomes a challenge because people would not understand you mm -hmm. because now you, you had left Syria as um, an upholder of, uh, of Ramon and now you're coming back and yeah. you're professing the God of the Israelites, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So that can be met with resistance, can be met with challenges. Ridicule. Ridicule, eh? you know? Mm. And then now you can imagine that uh, the challenge that he faces by going back to Syria and experiencing that mm -hmm. and then coming back to Israel again as someone who is uh, new in this faith, really? you know, now is experiencing a challenge of being experiencing judgment and criticism mm. from the Israel, from the, from the children of, of, um, of, 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 of Judah, yeah. um, you know, um, because he is a new convert and he is still yet to learn mm, um, still of the principles yes. of the word of God. So, how do you think we can make things easier for, make it maybe make it a bit practical in our modern day and age? Because I have a friend who recently got baptized into, into the church and it does not come from a, an Adventist yes. background, you know. So, she uh, has been meeting challenges with um, not being accepted at home mm. and then also finding it difficult to integrate into the church. How do you think we can meet these types of people halfway, just like Naaman? OK, 
Okay, I think for the part about being accepted at home, I think it will take time. Mm. If they, I'm sure any good family, if they see that you are, you believe in something, they are most likely to support you. Mm. But we don't live in an ideal world, but we can just pray that mm. the family is with them. But as for assimilating into the church, I think, I know a few weeks ago, we had another lesson where they were talking about how the disciples when was it after Pentecost, they were, they would take those new converts and be with them, like a sort of apprenticeship of sorts. So in this way, I think not an apprenticeship, but you are with them yeah. every step of the way. They are your friends, right? You talk to them, you spend time with them. And it doesn't even have to be church things all the time. Just build a relationship and try to introduce them to other people, to your friends from church, mm. I think that can also help mm. to build that community. Because I feel like church should be like family in a way. Mm. There should be connection. I know it's not like that. Yes. Because we are human and we have our flaws. But mm. I think in the end, it should be a place where it's easier to build connections mm. and you can talk to people and not feel judged. Mm. So judge less, be kind, just try to make them feel like a part of it. Don't force them to do things they're not comfortable with. But, and sometimes people can just see what you do, your character, how you behave, and try to assimilate and to simulate, to try to be better in a way. So mm. just be there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's a lot to learn from uh, the story of Naaman and mm. his encounter. Yes. For us not to rush them. Mm, yeah. And now, just speaking of rushing, <laughs> let us now move on to Nicodemus, um, oh. another interesting man. Mm -hmm. See, what I found interesting about Nicodemus is that he doesn't come to Jesus during the day, but at night. <laughs> so, Nicodemus was described as a, as a man who was um, wealthy and powerful and had a very good reputation amongst the Jewish ranks. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was reading during the week, Mm -hmm. um, of um, certain people who had, certain Jews uh, in the Bible mm -hmm. who believed in Christ but did not confess him openly. So this sort of tied back to this, but then Nicodemus yes. for me became a different individual because yeah, he, went, yes, he went, yes, he went and, 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 and had an encounter with, with yes. Jesus. So uh, in a way, you know, as I was reading about Nicodemus, it's very easy for us to think of him as, uh, someone who has weak in faith, but in many ways we may find, find ourselves um, experiencing such shortfalls as well, mm. where we do not confess Christ um, openly. So uh, Nicodemus was a powerful man, very wealthy, mm. and yeah, his reputation and his interactions with people really mattered to him. Yes. So how he behaved um, was quite governed by how people viewed him, mm -hmm. you know, and the relationships and, and the, a reputation, and the to reputation uphold. <laughs> to uphold, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> he subsequently goes to meet Christ at night, you know, and mm -hmm. has, has this very interesting encounter with him. So um, what does, you know, the encounter that Nicodemus have uh, with Jesus tell us um, about how life was at the time for Jews who had believed in Christ, but it was really difficult for them to confess mm. it openly. Okay, since uh, the entire lesson is tied back to mission to the powerful, right? We expect the powerful to have like everything they have together. Mm. Everything about them should be perfect. Anyone who's in the public eye, we, we like to see them. And as people who have everything, they have very little failings. And even if they do, I feel like they will try to hide them. So in that way, I can understand what Nicodemus was. Because think of a celebrity coming to church. Like, that would draw attention. Mm. Maybe it was the same for Nicodemus. And he thought, you know what? If I go during the day, too many people will see me. So he goes at night. But I think the time of day doesn't matter as much as what he got from mm. that mm. little moment with Jesus. Like He went at night, mm. asked some questions, and learned something. How can a man be born again? He learned all this. How, by that simple encounter of going there, even if it was at night. So what can this teach us? 
in the grand scheme of mission to the powerful. I guess we should try to be, uh, you know, Perhaps patient with like them. Patient, mm. right? Just because someone is rich doesn't mean they have, what am I trying to say? I know I'm trying to say something, mm. <laughs> but mm. the language is failing me, which is fine. Mm. Anyway, uh, let's move We can on. get back when to that. Yes, exactly. So an another thing which I was thinking about um, is it spoke, the lesson spoke of his pride. So mm. Christ was someone who was able to discern the thoughts um, and the intents of the heart, right? Yeah. So his reason or his need for Christ is different from, say, um, Naman or um, oh, the first ne person, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar yeah. whom we had encountered in the beginning. Yes. Um, and it literally speaks of the rich young ruler. So oh. these people had something in common. They were mostly rich and very powerful people, mm. you know. But um, Nicodemus had the issue of pride. He, pride. His opinion of people or people's opinion of, of him, him yes. really mattered to him. Mm. And um, him upholding that, you know, that sense of um, feeling like a very uh, important person in, yeah. in that society as that, at that time was an important mm. thing. But... Eventually, we see that he humbles himself and goes to Christ mm -hmm. and has that encounter. So Christ is able to humble us. Maybe not quite in the way that um, Nebuchadnezzar so was humbled, hum I would hope. Praise the Lord yes, for that. with that. So <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm happy for Nicodemus that mm -hmm. he had a, a different encounter. encounter yes. mm. Because even later in the chapter, they describe like when Jesus was arrested and they were bringing him to the, was it the temple to the leaders of the Israel? He was one to say, will we judge a man without letting him say his piece? Like, mm. even after his death, I think Nicodemus was one of the people who was really changed by his encounter with Jesus. So. Mm. And even what you're saying right now about how, what were you saying? How, oh, the word, gone. Um, I was speaking of um, the different encounters, so... Nicodemus, uh, his encounter being different to that of, of Nebuchadnezzar, mm -hmm. um, you know, so um, it just, for me, my understanding was that um, just because these people were all wealthy and, and powerful, their needs were different. Ah, yes. Mm. Now I remember what I wanted to say. Mm. So Nicodemus had pride, right? Mm. And I realized that that's not a thing that's only for rich people. Mm, it's, it's not, it's not, yes, um, we all have that sometimes. Yes. Mm. Because so, some people are self-conscious about the, and about the things they do. You feel like you're being watched. Mm. And mm. It's the imaginary audience. Mm. Yes. So I understand that. It's something we as well should work on. I think it's not a problem that's specifically left for the powerful and the rich and all that. Mm. It's something we should see in ourselves as well, do we have this pride? How is it affecting us in our lives? Where is it stopping us from doing the things that could otherwise help our salvation or help other people because we're too proud? Yeah, something like that. Mm, <laughs> sure. So now moving on to uh, Wednesday. Yes. It's now speaking about the rich, I suppose, the much anticipated. The topic. young rich. Oh, yeah, the much anticipated. Yeah, much anticipated. <laughs> because I think when we, when we discussed this, Mm. The, the title of uh, the lesson, uh, you had automatically said right. mission to the rich. Yes, yeah, it's just that we're associated so the powerful the powerful with the rich. With like the rich like right, mm. so uh, mission to the rich. Mm -hmm. um, we are given two people here, yes. uh, two scenarios. One of the rich young ruler mm -hmm. and then that of Zacchaeus. Yes. Two, uh, both very wealthy people, mm -hmm. but their needs, again, as, as we had said, are very, mm -hmm. very different. We see the rich young ruler is someone who is really battling with his love for his wealth and his riches, yes. you know. He's really attached to them mm -hmm. emotionally. And when he has his encounter with Christ and oh. Christ tells him to sell everything that he has and, give it, and give it away to the poor, he's very gutted and disappointed. Ish. So I just want to understand from you briefly why you think that is mm. um, and why Christ had specifically targeted his riches and mm. why he didn't speak about it with that most of with these other Zacchaeus, people. For Zacchaeus, example, right? for example. Mm. Yeah. So for the young rich man, Jesus said, he the young man followed the laws of mm. the Bible, right? He said as much. 
So Jesus tells him to sell all his wealth and give it away and follow him. Mm -hmm. And this just broke his poor heart. Mm -hmm. Wow, mm -hmm. I can't. So I think Jesus went straight for his wealth mm -hmm. because this young man was very attached to his. We can see by his response. Mm -hmm. And that wealth is his everything. It's what he treasures most in the world. Mm -hmm. He treasures it more, more than following Jesus, whom he knows that he is Christ. He's God's son. He knows this, but because of his wealth, it, it just takes him away from that. And I think, I hope that he changed someday. Like, maybe that encounter changed. We mm. don't encounter him ever again, right? Yeah. Maybe he changed gradually over time and realized, eh, mm. maybe this world isn't everything. But I think it talks to us in this world then, as we are now. Mm. We shouldn't be too attached to things of this world, mm. because those things, they, they, they won't save us in the end, because this world isn't something that will last forever, right? Forever. So True. we should be careful mm. what you get attached to. It doesn't have to be wealth, it's small things. Mm. I could be so attached to my phone that I would die mm -hmm. if it was lost, <laughs> yeah. or at least it yeah. feels that way. Yeah. You get so attached to things, mm. and I think the only thing we should get attached to maybe we should really cling to, is the word, it's Jesus, it's God, because mm. they will save us, save us ultimately in the end. Yes. Because this world is coming to an end after all, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, very interesting take. And, mm. um, you know, I, 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 moving on to Zacchaeus now, he, his, his case is, is a little bit different. Right. <laughs> yeah, so he, he is actually willing to um, return or give back what he has cheated mm. people out of. Right, so his 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 need was was a bit different. Yes. His encounter with with Jesus was a bit different. So, just can we just briefly discuss Nicodemus, um, and the contrast that he had between him and the and the rich young ruler. Oh, Nicodemus Nicod was Zacchaeus. Sorry, did I say Nicodemus? <laughs> I keep mixing up things. No, so Zacchaeus. You know, Zacchaeus. Similar names. Similar so names. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Zacchaeus. Well, for Zacchaeus, as you already pointed out, mm. he was willing to let go of his things, mm. but that, did, that didn't make him like infallible. He had things to work on as well. Mm. And I think that can, in our mission to the rich and the powerful, I think we should realize that everyone has different needs. Sometimes the wealth isn't the thing that's stopping them from being saved mm. or their attachment to that wealth. Mm. There's always something else in this life. So I think Building a relationship a can relationship. help with that, yeah. Mm. Should, even that whole don't be too forceful thing mm. can be helpful in learning what it is that they actually need. And pray for strength. God yeah. knows everyone's hearts, right? Mm. He will find a way to help us out. To I'm help sure. us, for sure. Mm. And uh, a thing that I found quite uh, interesting about Zacchaeus is um, his, his, despite his, uh, his character flaws, you know, Mm -hmm. As someone who was very wealthy, but his wealth was ac acquired through fraudulent very means, fraudulent sort of. means, mm. you know, cheating people out of their money, so forth and so on. But I just loved the uh, the in the dynamics and interactions between him and Christ, Christ and the people. Mm -hmm. So as Christ goes to eat at Zacchaeus's house, yes. you know, they're now judging him to say, oh, wow. "Why is this man eating with a sinner?" A sinner? can sort of think of it as any politician now who is accused of, uh, you know, yeah, some of the basis corruption. We're in South Africa, you know, a, a lot of politics, it's uh, a lot of co uh, corruption flying around. So <laughs> you can think of, mm. you know, a very corrupt individual who is up there in mm. power, you know, now and Christ is dining decides. with them, you know. Would, I think automatically would be like, why, mm. what's, what's going on, right? Of all the people, of all the people that Lord. God could have dined with. <laughs> You know, yeah. so it just comes to show that no one is beyond um, salvation. No yes. one is beyond redemption. God is for everyone. God is for everyone. Mm. Even the most basest of people, the mm. most depraved people, God. God can minister to those people. Yes. So I, th I found that um, a very interesting, mm. interesting um, dynamic. And now, uh, mission to the powerful now. Is that Thursday? Uh, this is now Thursday. So mission to the powerful. The powerful. So um, for me... Um, this is a very, very interesting one because the powerful are often very difficult to reach, you True. know? 
um, very, very difficult to reach. But the powerful are also people who are in need of God. Mm -hmm. They are in need of a Jesus encounter. Yes. And there are plenty of um, examples in the Bible um, where powerful, powerful people have had encounters, as we can see. Mm -hmm. We've named quite a few. Quite a few. Mm. So I just want to maybe, um, as we close off, just get your understanding of the importance of not neglecting uh, powerful people because we tend to focus on the poor and those who are in yes. need. Yes. And we tend to neglect the powerful mm. people who also are in need of Christ and a, mm. a, a Christ-focused or Christ-centric experience. So, mm. yeah, just, just your thoughts on that. So for Thursday, I saw they also mentioned how, they mentioned a few rich people like Joseph of Arimathea and someone else who I forgot, but there was a part where these people, Jesus didn't go looking for them. They came to him because of who he was. Mm. So I think, so who we are, like as a church, as people in the community, how we help others, what we're known for can help them come to us because they won't just go to church because it's a church. They need to know that it's genuine. Some of these people, powerful as they are, they need something to fill their lives because everyone has a longing for something to fill them. Mm. And Jesus can fill that hole in some people's lives. And these powerful people, even if we can't reach them presidents, you know, we can't reach royalty. Like, who are we? But <laughs> <laughs> the way we act, the way we behave, what we're known for in the community, are we helpful people? Are we kind people who help others bring them, not even bringing them closer to God, just being there for them when people need something. The rich people love charity, <laughs> most of them anyway. They like to give things away because not all of them are, are like selfish people. They understand that they have wealth and they would love an opportunity to give it away. And I think if we are the kind of people who are kind to everyone, they can come to us to help out with like distributing things. Mm -hmm. But this is just practical, my view anyway. But it can help that the way we behave with the community, how we act, as part of a community mm. can help like bring powerful people to us even if we're not exactly looking for them just be christ-like be the best christ-like person you can be pray for strength and mm. they might come they might not but still be helpful be kind be be like christ to help people be there for the community for those people in need and if God wants to send people your way, he will. Mm. I think he will. Yeah, and I like that uh, closing remark of um, Christ bringing people to you. Because mm -hmm. I'm aware of um, ongoing efforts that the church has in terms of reaching some, some of the most powerful people mm -hmm. here in South Africa, in neighboring countries, and abroad as well. Mm. Um, such as the United States president as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm aware of people uh, from within the church who have uh, interacted with the presidents of the United States in the past. Mm. Um, I'm aware of um, some monarchs here in our region <laughs> um, who are in contact with people yes. from the church as well. So God has his way of bringing these people maybe difficult maybe for you and me to yes. have yes. access to those kind of people but God has his people that he has set aside with a specific purpose of reaching out to those people mm -hmm. just as much as he will set aside his people for reaching to those who are in need so um, there is a great need for ministering to all types of people from all walks of life yes both the wealthy and the poor mm -hmm. God's for everyone exactly so yeah God's for everyone I mm -hmm. think those will be our parting words for yes. for this um, for this lesson. So, mm -hmm. as much as we were focusing on um, God for the needy, mm -hmm. I think um, ultimately we should um, walk away with the understanding that God is indeed for everyone. Yes. We thank you all for tuning into mm -hmm. this week's installment, um, this week's Sabbath school lesson. Mm -hmm. We pray that God may bless each and every one of you, and that He may equip us all to reach out to the needy and the powerful in whichever um, sphere of influence we may find them. So I will once again ask my friend Sia to close for us in prayer. Okay. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we have heard what you have to say to us. 
be with us throughout the week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you all and God bless you. Thank you for being part of our Sabbath School community. We invite you to continue watching and exploring our study together. To access more of our enriching lessons and dive deeper into the teachings, simply download the Adult Sabbath School lessons at www.ssnet.org. Sharing this link can make a difference and potentially save a life. Join us in this journey of spiritual growth and discovery. Thank you for being part of our Sabbath School family.